Hi everybody, it's been two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukraine is under attack by land, sea and air. The largest invasion of a neighboring country in Europe since World War II. The war has brought darkness to Ukraine. Ongoing war in Eastern Europe has severely impacted the world order. And when this war started, many economists in the world predicted that the Russian economy would completely collapse. Because Russia was not just in war with Ukraine, it was also battling against the United States and the European Union. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. We can never match the sacrifices and the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. We've already seen the impact of our actions on Russia's currency and the ruble. So Russia was practically fighting an economic war with two of the most powerful economies in the world. But you know what guys, somehow in spite of 17,000 sanctions, Russia's economy has not collapsed even after two years. The sanctions are not working. The Russian economy is growing. Russia's economy has performed better than some of its Western rivals. Russia's economy is projected to grow 2.6% this year. And this is so shocking that today the IMF itself has revised its GDP growth forecast of Russia by 1.5% to 2.6%. And many economists say that there has been no change in the living standards of the people in Russia at all. Despite the war and sanctions, the Russian economy is still growing. So what's driving Russia's economic resilience? The average income is up, unemployment at a record low and the budget deficit is still manageable. In fact, now it is one of the fastest growing economies among the G7 countries. So the question is, how did Russia manage to keep its economy afloat even after two years of war? What is their secret strategy that is keeping them intact in spite of going against the most powerful countries in the world? And last and most importantly, what are the lessons that India needs to learn from the extraordinary endurance of Russia? This video is brought to you by Geeks for Geeks. We all know by now that coding is a valuable skill for the future. Whether you are aiming for a tech career or you are just trying to learn a new skill, coding enhances problem solving, boosts creativity and offers versatile applications. In today's ever-changing industry, being a dynamic coder is not just an option, it is a necessity. And guess what? Geeks for Geeks provides a beginner-friendly course covering coding basics, web development and data science. It goes by the name Coding for Everyone. So if you are not from the field of tech and if you want to learn, this is just the perfect course for you. Last time I spoke to you about the 390 challenge and according to sources, it turned out very well for the students as a lot more people are seriously attending classes, solving practical problems and because of that, it is now back in a much bigger and better way. So if you buy a course during April and complete about 90% of it in 90 days, Geeks for Geeks promises to give you a 90% refund. And along with it, it also provides many more benefits. And guess what? It doesn't stop here. This challenge will keep you motivated to complete the course and it will help you acquire a new skill in just 90 days. And trust me guys, Geeks for Geeks never lets you run low on motivation. So if you want to learn coding in the best and the easiest possible manner, use the link in the description and get yourself registered now. The first reason why Russia didn't fall is because the West wrongfully assumed that Russia is a state-run economy and not a market-run economy. For those who don't know, there are two types of economies. One is a state-run economy like North Korea and the other is a market-run economy like India. A state-run economy is where a country has centralized decision-making, which means that the state will control all the output prices and resources in different sectors in the economy. For example, in North Korea, the government itself controls everything from which crop to produce to how much crop to produce, at what prices to sell and who to sell to. So if India was a dictatorship nation like North Korea, as some people say, then you know what the government would do? Since India is facing a Kaveri dispute due to water crisis, the government would just kill or arrest all the protesters and then they would ban rice and sugarcane in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and then the government would make millet production compulsory for farmers. Why? Because millet consumes less water, it is drought prone and it is the only way to provide water for both states without disputes. So this way the government can take both logical or illogical decision without the consent of the people. But fortunately since we are not North Korea, the government lets the market decide the course of production. 
So since we are a market run economy instead of the state or the government the market forces control the production so in india people are automatically coming to know about the benefits of millets as a result the demand for millets in shops is increasing so these retailers they are demanding more millets from the wholesalers as a result the wholesalers are demanding more millets from the farmers and eventually the farmers are now growing millets in india and the maximum a government could do in this entire process is spread awareness and incentivize the production of millets. let's this is the difference in operation between a state run economy like north korea and a market run economy like india now the biggest problem with the state run economy is that the businesses don't prosper there is a lot of inefficiency in management of resources and the nation as a whole is not at all equipped for a crisis for example in india back in 1991 we had the license raj of the government so even though there was a huge demand for watches in the market you could not start a watch company at all so you have to wait for the government to spot the opportunity and then the government itself would start a watch company and then sell watches to make money so in the system if you see no entrepreneur would care to even find a gap in the market this is the reason why the businesses don't prosper which means less jobs are created in the economy and eventually the economy itself slows down and as we all know government companies are extremely slow to react to modern market trends right this is the disadvantage of being a state run economy so during this time if there is a crisis like sanctions merely because of the slow and inefficient system of the government the economy would collapse this is the fundamental difference between a state run economy and a market run economy if this is clear to you let's come to russia now in the context of russia the west expected the russian economy to crumble because they assumed russia to be a state run economy but somehow to everybody's surprise russia turned out to be a market driven economy wherein the market forces in russia quickly reacted to the sanctions every single sanction has failed despite the war and sanctions the russian economy is still growing you can see the russian economy actually grew by 1.8% and that's more than most of the countries in europe its monthly income from oil exports is booming it's now greater than it was before the ukraine russia war so the question is how did this reaction happen to such a big knee jerk reaction like sanctions in the economy and more importantly how did russia make a comeback because of these companies well if you look at the russian markets before the war russia was dependent on g7 and other european countries to import commodities so russia imported pharmaceuticals clothing and textiles chemicals plastics and other materials to meet the demand of its population but after the war 50% of its imports from eu and g7 more or less completely collapsed but because the market forces were in action the industries quickly found new suppliers and the market reacted to this force and you know who became a savior for russia it is none other than china if you look at this graph russia replaced its g7 and eu imports with the chinese imports to such an extent that in 2019 while their imports stood between 12 to 15 billion dollars less than 3 billion dollars worth of imports came from china so almost 10 billion came from eu and the rest came from g7 countries But today if you look at the same charts Russian imports are the same as 2019 but now more than 7 billion dollars is coming from China less than 3 billion dollars is coming from EU and the rest is coming from G7 countries so Russia is practically back to the 2019 position it's just that they have different import partners this is the first reason for Russia's endurance which is the economy being a market driven economy and not a state run economy If this is clear to you let's come to the second reason which is their war economy you see guys the gdp growth is nothing but an increase in the economic activity in a particular country so your gdp grows when there is an increase in production and consumption of the goods and services in the country this production and consumption can be of both civilian as well as military goods in case of russia it is military goods that are boosting the economy in fy23 almost 10% of the gdp was spent on war related industrial output and now according to the bank of finland institute for emerging economies war related industrial output in russia increased by 35% in 2023 while civilian output remained flat and in 2024 also war related output is expected to be 6% of the entire gdp and these numbers tell us two things number one russia's economy is not prospering normally it is prospering abnormally due to war 
And number two, it also tells us that Putin is in no mood to stop the war at all. And this shift in output has made the defense sector of Russia a very, very important part of the Russian economy. In fact, 520,000 new jobs were made in the military industry and around 3.5 million Russians work in the military sector. This is about 2.5% of their entire population. And you know what? The people who make war equipments in Russia are actually earning more than many office workers and lawyers in Russia. So because of this, people are shifting from other industries to the military sector. And if you understand this scenario, this might sound very familiar to you. And this is where Russia might collapse into something called the Dutch disease. Does this ring a bell to you? If it does, then you have watched our Saudi Arabia episode. So if you want to know more about the Dutch disease, do watch this case study that we made on Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's Dutch disease problem. But long story short, since the employers are paying more in the defense sector, the employees from other industries are shifting to the defense sector. And because of this, the companies that have their employees transitioning, they have to pay more wages so that they can retain these employees. As a result, other companies in other sectors are forced to pay more wages because if they don't pay, these employees will then jump into the defense sector. So even though business is difficult, the worker wages in Russia is increasing. Now, in addition to that, Russia is also facing another problem. Because of the mobilization of the population for the war, there isn't enough labor left to work in other jobs. On top of that, 1 million Russians decided to leave Russia because of the war. So this has again caused labor shortages in Russia, which has again forced the businesses to offer higher wages for their workers. This is the reason why wages are increasing in Russia, people's disposable income is increasing, and that is leading to more demand and consumption of goods and services and eventually it is leading to an economic growth in the country. But do you see something strange in the story guys? If you see these workers are demanding wages, that is fine. But the question is how is the government getting all this money to spend on military in spite of the sanctions? Well, this is what brings us to the third reason why Russia's economy is not collapsing, which is oil. So let's understand this better. You see, when the US and Europe put so many sanctions on Russia, oil and gas were the primary commodity trade that got affected. Because if you look at this chart, before the war, Russia was making $275 billion just with oil and gas. So the West thought if they cut off their oil trade and sanctions and prevent other countries from buying oil from Russia, then automatically the Russian economy would collapse. And here's where if you remember, the West forced India to deny Russian oil. And here's where our foreign minister gave the West a fitting reply. Europe imported in the same period six times the energy which India did. Essentially, if it is a matter of principle, why didn't Europe cut on the first day? Why didn't we see on 25th of February a complete cutoff of energy imports from Russia? But you can't say is? you can't say it's my principle, but by the way, I will do it by my timing. But you know what, guys? Oil is not the only major contributor to the Russian economy. As it turns out, in 2021, Russia did not just supply 17.5% of the entire world's oil. It also sold 47% of the palladium sold in the world, 16.7% of nickel, 13% of aluminium, and almost a quarter of potash fertilizers sold in the entire freaking world. So when the West sanctioned Russia, they only increased the profit margin of Russian oil and other commodities. Now, some of you might find this sentence confusing and you might ask how on earth are the Russian profit margins increasing because of the sanctions? Well, let me explain. You see, when supply of oil was cut off in the world, the oil prices spiked. And if you look at this graph, the oil prices went from $70 to $80 a barrel to more than $110 a barrel just after the war. This is because suddenly, when Russian oil and gas were sanctioned in the market, other oil producing countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar increased their prices to leverage the excess demand of oil in the market. So if Russians were selling 1 million barrels of oil a day at $80 a barrel in January 2022, then they would make $80 million, right? But after the war, when oil prices increased to $110 a barrel, even if Russia sold 800,000 barrels, they would still make $88 million. So that is a 10% increase in revenue, even though they sold 20% less oil. In fact, even if Russia gave a 10% discount, they would have still made $79.2 million with the same 80% sales. So you see, even though the Russian oil is sold in less quantity, the revenue that Russia made with oil remained the same or it increased. 
So basically, only profit margins increased because of the sanctions. And this is not just applicable to oil, but every other commodity that Russia exported, which is everything from palladium to aluminium to even wheat. So if you look at the scenario, when Russia's exports to EU reduced by 68% and oil prices increased by 30%, the revenue of Russia did not reduce at all. Why? Because other countries were buying oil from Russia and that too at higher rates than in January 2022. For example, Russia replaced most of its lost trade with Europe with increased trade with India and China. In fact, in 2019, the European Union spent 112 billion euros into buying fossil fuels from Russia. And in 2023, EU countries still spent 83.3 billion euros to buy Russian oil. So here there is almost a 30 billion dollar gap, right? Well, guess what? Here's where China was making up for this 30 billion dollar loss because in 2022, China increased its oil purchase from Russia by 45% and it is still buying oil from Russia. This is the second reason why the Russian economy is not collapsing. And lastly, oil was and still is going to European countries with something called a shadow fleet. For those who don't know, a shadow fleet is a network of oil tankers that are not registered with the conventional international shipping registries and they operate under the radar of mainstream tracking and regulatory services. For example, if Russian oil needs to be shipped to France, instead of sending it straight from Russia to France using a single ship, the Russian ship would depart from Russia and in the middle of the ocean, it will meet another ship where the oil tankers are transferred from the Russian ship to the shadow ship. This ship will have the flag of a country like Panama and the insurance papers and certifications are changed in such a way that it looks like the oil is coming from Panama. So the European traders do not have to abide by the sanctions because they can show it on paper that they're buying oil from Panama and not from Russia. In fact, CNN actually put out a map on how Russian oil was being brought to India to avoid international pressure. So if you look at this map, in step number one, the ship departs from Russia, travels through the Black Sea and then docks at the Laconian Gulf in Greece. And here's where there is a ship to ship transfer of oil. And eventually, this ship travels to India and then delivers oil to Indian traders. So this way, Russia got its oil revenue, the shadow fleet got its commission, and the European and Indian traders got their oil to supply to make a profit for themselves without actually being restricted by the sanctions. And you know what guys, according to the KSE estimates, there were at least 187 shadow tankers carrying Russian crude and refined petroleum products all across the world. Russia is now China's biggest supplier of oil. Surpassed Saudi Arabia to become China's top crude oil supplier in 2023. Now Russia has emerged as India's second biggest supplier of crude oil. Reaching their highest level in 2024. So because of finding new partners, increased oil prices and shadow of fleet, Russia has made so much money that according to the Kyiv School of Economics, Moscow would have made $178 billion just from oil sales in 2023. And this number will increase to a potential $200 billion this year. You know how much money that is? It is $55 billion more than what they made in 2019. So in short, the flow of money into Russia has remained intact in spite of the sanctions. And lastly, since war did not happen on Russian land, the households are safe and the Russian businesses are running as usual. This is the reason why, if you see, Russia's economy contracted by 1.2% in 2022, but in 2023, its GDP rose by 3.1%. Whereas if you look at Ukraine's GDP, it plunged by 29% in 2022 and in 2023, they just grew by 4.9%. So the ultimate question over here is, does this mean the Russian economy is booming and Russia has nothing to worry about? Well, not really, because Russia is still facing three big problems, which could then become a situation of crisis for Russia. The first challenge is its volatile currency. During these two years, the Russian ruble went through significant fluctuations. If you see this chart, the dollar to rubles ratio was 80 rubles to the dollar. But as tensions grew in February 2022, it reached a record low of 136 rubles to the dollar by March 2022. But as their trades recovered, the value of rubles started to touch 102 rubles to the dollar. So it's still a 25% decrease in value since 2019. And the reason why this is still worrisome is because all of this is happening in spite of Putin asking traders to pay in ruble, in spite of the boost in oil and gas trade due to oil spikes, and in spite of the Russian banks controlling the currency value. So this is not good at all because in a way Russia is now acting like a state-run economy. The second problem that Russia is facing is the transfer of money from Russia to other countries. In fact, when I was in Abu Dhabi, 
A friend of mine told me that a Russian would just casually come in and they would just buy a 20 million dollar penthouse within a day and just leave. This is done so that they can safely park their money in real estate while their country is in crisis. And now, Russia has banned its citizens from transferring money abroad. So again, this is a big, big red flag for any economy. So the value of the ruble is more or less artificially controlled by the Russian government. And again, like I said, here's where Russia is acting like a state-run economy. So this is not something that can work in the long run. And it's not just the dollar, ruble has also depreciated with respect to yuan. So the Chinese goods are also becoming costly due to this value loss in currency. If you look at this graph, the highest inflation rate in Russia was 17.8% in April 2022. And then it started decreasing. So as the ruble is depreciating, inflation in the country is increasing, which is again leading to an increase in interest. And the worst part is the Russian ruble has depreciated by 25% against the Chinese yuan. Which means, in 2023, if it costed you 100 rubles to buy a kg of potato, a year later, it's now costing you 125 rubles a kg. So this is a direct inflation rate of 25% in the past one year itself. And this is again very, very scary. And the last concern that Russia has is that this boost in economy is caused due to war. And if you look at history, this war boost in the economy is always followed by an economic crisis. Because suddenly, the demand for weapons drops, the workers are fired, unemployment increases and suddenly, there are less people making money and there is too much unemployment in the market. And you know why I'm saying this with so much confidence? Well, take a look at what happened after World War I and World War II. The war changed the world. The impact of World War II on the global economy was profound and long-lasting. In the aftermath of the fighting, the world order changed. Five million were unemployed in America. 4.5 million in Germany, 2 million in Britain. So this is the state of the Russian economy, where their oil money is still coming, they are bleeding cash, they are controlling inflation, and their war and mineral economy is keeping them afloat. So if Russia conquers Ukraine and gets hold of their sunflower export, farms and oil, then all this might be worth it. If not, then again Russia may face a massive crisis or perhaps it may even disintegrate just like the Soviet Union. This is the story of the Russian economy. So this brings us to the last part of the episode and that are the lessons that India needs to learn from the endurance of Russia. Lesson number one, market run economy is and will always be better than a state run economy. So we need to ease off the government control in many many sectors so that the market can calibrate for both good and bad conditions. Lesson number two, war will always lead to an economic output that may seem amazing on the outset but then it will be followed by a depression. So war economy is not real growth in the economy. And lastly, we need to desperately pump up our manufacturing. And you know, I am extremely envious of the Chinese because they just grabbed a $7 billion export opportunity in Russia. Whereas because we are not the best manufacturers in the country, this was an easy $7 billion opportunity that we missed due to lack of preparation. So as citizens, we need to push our politicians to turn India into a manufacturing economy. I've said this multiple times, but I just hope in 2040, if there's an opportunity, India could go on to grab that opportunity before China. These are the lessons that India needs to learn from the endurance and the story of Russia. And I just hope you learned something valuable in this case study. And don't forget to check out the Geeks for Geeks challenge from the link in the description. That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>